Hello, my friends. I hope you're having a good day. Let us know how to pray for you. Please post your prayer needs right there on the page, and we'll be happy to pray for you. You know, we're continuing our revisit of the 316 series based on my book, 316. Today's message explores the authority of Jesus, and one powerful example of this among many is in Mark chapter 4. Why don't we recall the scene? Jesus and the followers are in a boat, and they're crossing the Sea of Galilee. A storm arises suddenly, and what was placid becomes violent. Monstrous waves rise out of the sea, and they slap the boat. Mark describes it clearly. He says a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. That's in chapter 4 in verse 37. Can you imagine yourself in that boat? It's a sturdy vessel, no doubt, but no match for these 10-foot waves. It plunges nose first into the wall of water and the force of the wave dangerously tips the boat until the bow of the boat seems to be pointing straight at the sky. A dozen sets of hands join yours in clutching the mast. All your shipmates have wet heads and white eyes. You tune your ear for a calming voice, but all you hear are screams and prayers. All of a sudden, it hits you. Someone is missing. Where is Jesus? He's not at the mast. He's not grabbing the edge. Where is he? You turn and you look, and there, curled in the stern of the boat, is Jesus sleeping. You don't know whether to be amazed or to be angry, so you are both. How can he sleep at a time like this? How could he sleep through this storm? Simple. He was in charge of it. Jesus got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. Verse 39. The raging water becomes a stilled sea instantly, immediately calm, not a ripple. The waves are his subjects and the winds are his servants. The whole universe is his kingdom. Now, if you've got storms in your life today, why don't you call upon the one with the authority to calm them? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Well, you all couldn't fit here on my porch, but you can all give some thought to this wonderful scripture. I hope you will. We really need Jesus today. We really need him. We really need him. We need him because according to John 3.16, God gave him and described him as the one and only son. In other words, there's no one like him anywhere. He is unique in history. And he claims to have authority, the authority, to help us face every challenge. Can we talk for just a few moments about Christ as the King of Kings? Does that strike you as irrelevant? If so, why don't you post your prayer needs, please, before you move on? Does it strike you as relevant? Are you intrigued by the idea of having the Lord of Lords as your advocate? Are you intrigued by the possibility that the one who made it all sustains it all and is watching over your day? If so, if you can give me about six minutes, we'll have a delightful conversation. Here's what Jesus said. He said this in Matthew 11. My Father has given me authority over everything. Everything. And then he goes on to say, no one really knows the Son except the Father, and no one really knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. That's Matthew 11 and verse 27. So Christ posits Himself as the one and only ruler and also the one and only revealer. He is the one who reveals the, the Father to us. No one really knows the Son, he says, except the Father. And no one really knows the Father except the Son. He, 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 I can get this word out. Jesus claimed an intimacy with God, a mutuality that 
he shared with the Father that no one else had. I, I think we married couples get just a little bit of this. You know, married couples finish each other's sentences. Married couples anticipate each other's actions. Uh, some married couples even begin to look like their mates. Now, that's a possibility that deeply troubles my wife. <laughs> Deanlin and I have been married for, well, it's going to be 39 years next month. We no longer converse. We communicate in code. She walks in the kitchen and she sees that I'm making a sandwich. And I say, Deanlin? And she says, no, I don't want one. I don't have to finish the sentence. I'll open the fridge and I'll stare for a few moments and I'll, I'll say, honey, and she'll look at my sandwich, <laughs> what I've gotten prepared thus far, and she'll say something like, well, the mayonnaise is on the top shelf, pickles are in the door. She knows what I'll say before I say it. I say it consequently. She can speak on my behalf. She can speak with credibility and authority. You know, she says... Max would prefer a different color, or Max would approve of this idea, well then listen to her, listen to her. And she knows what she's talking about. I mean, she qualifies as my proxy like no one else. How much more? How much more does Jesus qualify as God's? You see, Scripture says that Jesus exists at the very heart of the Father, and He has made Him as plain as day. I love that translation of John 1.18 from the message. So when Jesus says, My Father's house has many mansions, well, we can believe Him. We can count on it. He knows. He's walked them. <laughs> when He says, The eyes of the Lord are on the sparrows, well, we can trust Him. Jesus knows. He has seen the eyes of the Lord. When Christ declares, your Father knows the things you have need of. Whew. Matthew 6, 8. Believe it. After all, He was in the beginning with God. He was in the beginning with God. So Jesus claims to be not a top theologian, not an accomplished theologian, nor even the supreme theologian, but my friend, he is the only theologian. He says no one knows the Father except the Son. No one. He doesn't say no one really knows the Father like the Son or in the fashion of the Son, but he, he says no one really knows the Father except the Son. In other words, if we want to know God, we have to know Jesus. Heaven's door has one key, and Jesus holds it. He holds it. And gratefully, the one who holds that key offers to open the door for you and me. Now, these are dramatic words that Jesus states. They are. These are words that have caused people to turn away from Him. Overstatements, they say. Impossible, they say. And yet the reason we can believe them, and I'll say the reason I believe them, is because of the empty tomb. Jesus Christ, crucified on Friday, silent on Saturday, but rose from the dead on Easter Sunday. And when He stepped out of the tomb, my fears went in and they were buried. Why don't you trust Jesus? Why don't you? I do not know if these are the last days. I do not know. But I feel on my heart that Christ is calling to Himself a people. That He's, he's reaping a great harvest. Perhaps even invisible to our eyes because we're unable to gather in churches. But I believe He is harvesting for Himself a people. I do believe, I do know for certain that He will gather a group of people with whom He will create a new kingdom and a new earth. And I believe that He is issuing this invitation right now during these days, calling people to turn away from the brief entertainments of life 
and turn toward the source, the source of eternal hope. And I believe He will teach you. He is the ultimate authority, the only ruler, and He is the only revealer. Would you say yes to Him today if you never have? Would you just say, Lord Jesus, I accept you. I believe that for God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son. He gave His Son for me. Trust Him.